Good afternoon. I'm a historian by training, not an archaeologist. This means my slides will be slightly uglier uh, than they're accustomed to. But in my project that focuses on the study of animal feed production as a marker for the effectiveness of Roman economy and Roman husbandry economy in particular, uh, it is of course uh, yeah, logically that I use a lot of archaeological data next to other sources like ethnographical uh, literature and uh, anthropological literature. I started in earnest in January 2018 at this project, so a lot of it is still exploratory. In this presentation I will explain the historiography of the Roman Italian husbandry, the discussions about it, my critique on those debates to contextualize my research question, and then I will give a glimpse of what I will try to do with my model, uh, but that's the most exploratory part of this presentation. Then on to the historiography. Uh, studies focusing on Roman agriculture from the 1970s to the 1990s were uh, mostly focused on the food supply of ancient society and how that uh, corresponded to growing populations. And there was also a very influential debate between at one hand the primitivists and at the other hand the modernists who had wildly sometimes different interpretations of uh, how effective the Roman economy worked. But even early modernist authors like uh, K.D. White had very negative, pessimistic accounts, really, of what Roman husbandry can entail. And mostly these theories, both by those early modernists and the pessimists, where uh, the primitivists, sorry, are, uh, are, are to be summarized as a sort of tension between food supply for humans and food supply for animals and uh, the lack of good quality agricultural land in Italy due to dry summers, unpredictable rainfall, uh, and in the more temperate mountainous regions, the difficult terrain and periods of snow and ice were identified as hindrances for the blossoming of uh, husbandry economics. And so they assumed that mainly grain, olives, and grapes were produced. And that this also gave a negative feedback loop because of the lack of animals. There was a lack of manure and uh, the, uh, the, relatively, the relatively scarcity of agricultural land uh, played into that. And these ideas became the driving force behind the reasoning this, that uh, livestock holdings were mainly meager and mostly consisting out of uh, pastoral forms away from farms more uh, oriented toward food production for humans. But then, due to uh, contributions of uh, archaeologists, mainly archaeozoologists and archaeobotanists, this view shifted. The paleobotanical remains showed a variety of potential fodder and grazing products maintained near Roman Italian farms and large urban zones. And uh, this is also found back in the sources. When you look chronologically to the agronomists, you see that more species of plants are introduced, especially more legumes uh, and uh, the fabacea are introduced on the, on the land. And we see in general studies, compiling local studies like uh, McKinnon's production and consumption of uh, Roman animals, that there is a variety of animals on each farm and no signs of diseases due to malnutrition in almost all of the zooarchaeological uh, databases he, he uh, researches. So we see next to that also clear evidence through osteometric studies that the cattle sizes increased due to the whole Roman period and that they improved also in the provinces where husbandry practices were most likely introduced from the Italian mainland. And this we have a form of a mystery and that is how were the Roman Italians so successful in overcoming those hindrances from their natural environment to feed their cattle so successfully. And, then, oh, it's a bit the slides. Uh, and in a very recent uh, reinvigorating uh, debate about it, about how feedstuff or animal could be a marker of Roman productivity, there was uh, Geoffrey Crone who proposed that uh, the introduction of legumes was a catch-all solution almost for how animals could be, feed, uh, could be fed. 
And this, uh, this was mostly to do with the technique of lay farming, so alternating between grain and legumes, or with intercropping. Here we see uh, a field of onions intercropped with uh, veggies, and this intercropping uh, could lead also that agricultural land meant for food production was not uh, a hindrance to the land that could be used to feed animals also. But uh, more or less, this is the consensus today that uh, lay farming is the catch-all, the, the, the solution to the, the question why were Romans, Roman Italians uh, capable of feeding their animals. But maybe this is a somewhat uh, simplistic uh, explanation because uh, Italy, and Roman Italy of course also, is a very diverse uh, country and its regions and its landscapes are very different. And not all the landscapes are evenly suited for uh, lay farming uh, and the farming of legumes in general. We see in anthropological literature that there is a favorance of transhumans, especially in the south of Italy, where there is uh, a lot of droughts uh, during the summers. And that legume raising is not so interesting to feed your animals there, over there. And when we look at the uh, gas model, the, the model you see uh, on the, the right, the global agroecological zones model from the FIO, you see that uh, yeah, the capacity to produce legumes in, uh, and pulses in, in Italy is widely different. So it can be that for all the sites that were uh, attested in the zooarchaeological uh, data, that held a wide variety of healthy animals, that legumes are the only solution to that. And next to that, we also see when we look back into the primary sources, that mostly all uh, mentions of pulses and of green hay meant for uh, cattle and farm animals were conserved for the more vulnerable animals like lambs and uh, for animals that were used to uh, produce uh, a very specialized items like Tarentine sheep, known for their uh, wool. And uh, yeah, uh, next to that, it's, it's very striking that there is a bit of a benevolent reading by the proponents of the theory that legumes could uh, provide a catch-all solution to the question why Romans, uh, where Roman Italians are successful in feeding their animals. In the sources, they read that they know of these legumes and that these legumes must have been uh, used by a broad variety of farmers in Rome and Italy. And this was probably the case, but not at the scale that uh, cut a test for the zooarchaeological data we find. And another difficulty is, of course, that a lot of these legumes are also used in the human diet and that it's archaeologically very difficult uh, to seek out which remains are meant for animals and which remains are meant for humans. It's very easily uh, when you have a carbonized hay deposits or a storage room next, next to an animal pen, but these finds are uh, seldom uh, and, and scarce, so we can't really rely on that too. Then how did they maintain their lives so successfully? For that, based on anthropological literature, uh, pre-modern and modern economic history on husbandry practices and uh, contemporary sources, mostly developmental economics and, uh, uh, and mostly developmental economics from arid and semi-arid regions, I have four hypotheses I want to test with my model, uh, my GIS model. And those are that uh, outfields and agricultural byproducts are an integral part of all animal feeding strategies from elite farmers to smallholders that the integration of different context-based husbandry strategies was integral to the overall success of Roman husbandry, meaning that the Italian Romans uh, adapted their husbandry management systems to the landscapes they worked in over time. Uh, the third is that grazing pressure increased first on land suitable for arable cultivation. And the fourth is that carrying capacities varied locally in time and space, as well as the species of introduced animals and plants. Uh, and there is an interesting parallel to the, the earlier presentation, which the, the yeah, inclusion, the, the largening of the economic zone gives new opportunities to farmers to uh, yeah, find new ways to overcome natural hindrances. And then 
for the model, I have one goal to seek out what the potential livestock farming car carrying capacities were, if they did change over time, and if that change over time was an increase in exploited land, or an increase in animal density, or both simultaneously, or decreases, of course, and uh, if it did differentiate between regions, where Romans, by the largening of their empire, uh, suddenly aware that there was a comparative advantage to different landscapes. And did they use markets or other forms of exchanges to exploit that to its most uh, utmost capacity? And I use two different approaches. One is a landscape analysis, and one is uh, more based on site analysis. I use these sources to uh, go deeper into that, the uh, historical perspective, so the primary sources I, I already showed, the comparative perspective, the ethnography, uh, archaeology and archaeobotany, and also geographical uh, perspective, uh, mostly due to GIS and modern GIS data on elevation, on access to water, uh, that of course has to be uh, interpreted against the historical uh, data we have. And that all is integrated in a historical uh, GIS. And the first phase is this, the landscape analysis. And uh, for this combination for uh, PowerPoint to get, uh, I will uh, shortly uh, go over the main maps I intend to make. There are all different maps. First is, uh, is a mapping of which crops and animals were economically exploited and where in Italy. Is there a difference between the south, the north, the middle part? Uh, that we can find due, that uh, can be due, due to uh, legacy sources in archaeology and also by uh, historical manifestations. And we can validate it through the use of anthropological uh, literature. Then the second map is which landscapes were suitable for which crops. And if we can make a sort of typology of landscapes which were most suitable for which crops and which can give the most uh, preferable outcomes. Uh, therefore, I use select site surveys uh, and data provided from them on the uh, plant species that were uh, uh, cultivated on them, and also ethnographic uh, material to have concrete data because, of course, the data is very sparse. Then uh, I make known that about which landscapes are suitable for which animals, uh, based on uh, modern agricultural maps, based on elevation maps, based on access to water, based on even uh, possibilities for transhumans in a different landscape and how these how these are connected each other. Then I uh, make known that of which landscapes are accessible for whom, mostly due to uh, historical uh, legislative sources. The Idea Pudifus, for example, the, the public communal lands in Rome that was free to graze for most uh, farmers uh, in lieu of payments for uh, a small fee, uh, and the, the really private lands, and the emergence of larger uh, production nodes that uh, concentrated a lot of land and had as an influence that a lot of smaller farmers were pushed out of that land and it was more difficult for them to feed uh, their animals through those grazing lands. And then also, uh, I make a sort of classification, but I do not make it, I take it mostly from uh, Robert Richard, from Robert Richard for Durham, the classification of farm sizes. I look at which farm sizes are uh, attested in the archaeological record where I can place them throughout these maps. And I also try to uh, hypothesize uh, other farms, mostly smaller farms, because of course there is a, a bias towards larger farms, more urban regions, and for the more far off regions, inland regions, and smaller farms, I try to hypothesize these. And look what for results we can get when we compare this to the other maps for that we did. And then also, uh, as last but not uh, as least important, because it's seldomly done, is the role of markets integration, market activity. Which landscapes can be e can be easily reached? Uh, which food products and which uh, animal food products can be uh, transported easily? Uh, do we find also in the legislative uh, sources something back about maximum prices for these products and what are the capacities to uh, disperse them throughout market activity? That are the maps I want to make in this. Uh, 
research phase. And then the outcome of it should be a spatial analysis of husbandry potential, a series of opportunity maps, which changes over time. Uh, an economic analysis of the costs and benefits. Is there indeed uh, a tension between food and feed and how what is overcome? And uh, due to the, the use of different landscapes. And then uh, at last, a diagnosis of the key success factors for husbandry. Uh, throughout all the, the different maps and the comparison uh, between them. And then secondly, uh, I will do an in-depth site analysis based on uh, test case sites that uh, have yet to be uh, selected for the most part. I have a data set uh, given to me from uh, Robert Witcher and uh, Helen Goodchild on the Tiber Valley, uh, but I'm seeking out more data uh, to work with. And what makes a good case study for me is that there are different types of landscapes within a single project, uh, more hilly, more plains, an urban environment, smaller scale uh, farms that were researched. That's really interesting for me uh, to have a broad overview. Uh, the different farm sizes and the uh, yeah, social stratification within that landscape, that that is really well attested, that uh, there was not due to uh, time concerns or funding concerns, uh, a focus on the, on the more larger. Uh, yeah, okay. And then uh, the data, the geographical, the archaeological, the archaeobotanical data that I already uh, mentioned that we can uh, compile this together. That's, uh, and then for the, for the carrying capacities, I make an abstraction based on a modern uh, American model that's uh, the, the, the difference between my model and the, the commercial model to, to model uh, carrying capacities is, of course, they have an observational, an empiric model. They use observation. I have to make a mechanistic model. So I have to use ranges. These uh, figures you see here for the uh, minimal residual dry matter I'm looking for uh, are yeah, uh, ethnographical attested optimums, but uh, I will have to uh, make ranges of them with fuzzy numbers in the modeling to, uh, to, to really uh, attest for all the, the yeah, nuances I, I will have to take into account for. And then uh, the animal units have to be abstracted also. This comes to a very simple equation uh, of the production of uh, animal feed minus the residual dry matter that has to remain on the field uh, to uh, keep it fertile, to make it interesting uh, towards slave farming and to uh, not uh, yeah, make it barren over time. And then the divisor underneath is a figure that is uh, the ideal amount of uh, dry matter consumed by one animal unit per month. And then I can uh, figure out what an animal unit month is and how many months uh, a different landscape can feed one animal unit. This is then uh, how the model looks like in GIS, uh, because then of course all the other uh, data sets have to be incorporated and all the other data has to, be, has to be worked out from that simple equation. And then you have these types of maps uh, based on, uh, you can see it, the topography, the wood cover, distance to water sources, and how interesting it is for animals, uh, and for farmers to keep animals in that environment. And then uh, you can have a favorable production map. Now it's based on pounds of dry matter uh, that you can produce on, in a different landscape, but it could also work with uh, animal unit months when you can see how many months an animal can, how many animals can be fed for how many months in a different landscape. And that's, uh, should give the same outcomes as the first uh, research phase, but with a focus on localized forms of specialization and has been practiced with what is introduced. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, uh, <laughs> leave you with that <laughs> because my time is up. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>